The four Gospels that you know about officially have anonymous authors. But one apostle stepped up and took ownership of the one you never heard of until right now. In today's episode, we dig deep into the apostolic fight over the gospel of the Lord. The latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24-7 radio stream. Like a toxic family fight, it's been kept under wraps and largely glossed over by mainstream Christian denominations. But the events that led up to the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD are nothing short of earth-shaking. Our story begins around 34 AD, just after Jesus was murdered by Jews. Their previous attempts to kill him failed. One of them was when they were unable to throw him off the top of a cliff in Nazareth. And now the hunt was on for his apostles. The Pharisees wanted them all found and killed. Some escaped, most didn't. This was also around the time that St. Stephen was given a Sanhedrin show trial and stoned to death. Meanwhile in Jerusalem, the top Christian hunter and Pharisee's blue flame was named Saul. And he was going to be groomed for the top spot in the Pharisee pecking order. In fact, he was likely going to be the successor to Gamaliel himself. Such was Saul's zeal. The top rabbis had a lead on an apostle in hiding in Damascus somewhere, and they wanted Saul to find and capture him. The Jews were eager to put an end to any more of this Jesus talk in the region, and killing off the remaining apostles was seen as the best way to close the books on all the messy events of the last few months. After all, dead men tell no tales, and they certainly don't write Gospels. Now, the astute listener will bear in mind that during these apostolic manhunts, Peter, who had already denied even knowing Jesus, and James, remained in Jerusalem, apparently safe from attack for some reason, and living freely amongst the Jews. More on that later as the circle of our story is completed. So Saul gathered up his rabbinic posse and set off at dawn for Damascus, eager to put another notch in his Teflon box. Now, what happens next is fairly widely known. As Saul travels along the road to Damascus, he's blinded and struck by a revelation given to him. And this is written in the modern Bible and in the first Christian Bible, a revelation delivered to him directly by Jesus Christ. Now, as we all know, Jesus never wrote anything down when he was on earth among us. Not a single letter or scroll, never put read to papyrus or signed or wrote anything. And now we know why. Saul, now we know him as Paul, the Apostle Paul, would, with this revelation, become the living manifestation of those words. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, helps us put this into perspective. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. The New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. God's word would move first through the spirit of revelation before Paul wrote them down as the gospel of the Lord. Now, this revelation, this gospel of the Lord, was seared into his mind and soul. It would drive him to establish Christian churches throughout the known world. He would be beaten, whipped, stoned, almost drowned, imprisoned, and left for dead over the course of decades. But so driven was the Apostle Paul, he couldn't be stopped. Just imagine, one day overseeing the murder of Christians as the top Pharisee lieutenant of the Jews, and the next, leading the effort to spread the gospel of the Lord to the entire world. You see, that's the power of a direct intercession by Christ. And he wrote down every word of that revelation, every jot and tittle. Now, do you think it was the modern Bible Gospels of Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John that inspired Paul to do all these things? Don't be silly. Those Gospels didn't even exist around 34 AD. But 
how do we know for sure the gospel that Paul preached didn't come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Well, the answer is because Paul tells us so in no uncertain terms in Galatians 1.8. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ." Unquote. There you have it, plain as day. So simple, even a TV preacher can understand it. The gospel preached by Paul was powerful enough to convert millions when they heard it and establish new Christian churches all over the known world. It was powerful because it came directly in a revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, these are the facts, and they are undisputed. Right now, some of you are flipping through that modern Bible, probably the King James Version, and saying, Wait a minute, Darren, I don't see the gospel of the Lord in here. Where's Paul's revelation? What he, he preached and used to convert the Europeans? It's, it's not in here. And you'd be right. Well, kind of. You see, bits and pieces of those original verses are scattered throughout the modern Bible, and they can be found in the four Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Most of them are reworded and edited to fit within the larger framework of the Judaized modern Bible, though. But you can find them if you know where to look. Of course, I have a copy of the Gospel of the Lord, so for me and others that follow the pre-Nicene faith and original Bible, it's a little bit easier. And of course, it's also pretty easy to figure out how some of those verses and fragments got into those four Gospels. Now, take Mark and Luke, for example. Both were what? Oh, that's right. Both Mark and Luke were traveling companions of the Apostle Paul, and they spent a great deal of time with him and knew all about the Gospel of the Lord that he was preaching. And what did Mark and Luke both do after they left Paul? Oh, that's right. They both wrote a gospel. It's plain as day. Again, these are just the facts, and they are undisputed. This understanding of your history as a Christian is the cornerstone that everything else is built on. Build on the original rock of truth and facts, not on the shifting sands of alien Judaizers and their carnal deity. Now, one more time to be sure that we got it right before we move on. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're unclear about that sentence for any reason, stop right now, click off the podcast, and read it again until you fully absorb it. Okay, now we move into the mist, the, the haze, but it's not a problem because we have this foundation now, this flashlight that's going to help guide us through the theological forest. Now, now we know what Gospel Paul is talking about now, and we know where he got it from. And what did Paul do after this revelation? Did he pop right up and start hiring general contractors to build churches? No, not even close. We find out in Galatians, and the chapters that we're going to cover are the same in the pre-Nicene and in the modern Bible, we find out that he basically just laid low in the mountains for three years after that. He just let it all sink in. His life prior to that moment was gone. Everything, family, other Jews, Judaism, the Torah laws. He knew it was all a fraud now that he had the truth. And after three years, he finally makes his way back to Jerusalem. Now, he doesn't go and visit with Gamaliel, the chief Pharisee. He goes to visit with the apostle Peter. Peter and James have been safe in Jerusalem for the last three years while everyone else was being hunted down. Why? We don't know. But by the end of this episode, you're going to be able to make some pretty educated guesses. Now, not much is said about what happens at this meeting. Paul says he stayed with Peter and James for 15 days. And I have a feeling what they spent a lot of those 15 days talking about was the revelation Paul got directly from Jesus and what happened exactly on that road outside Damascus. The trip and visit we know the least about is probably the genesis for the great apostolic battle that would follow over a decade later at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. 
In part two of this episode, I'm going to get into the nooks and crannies of what I think happened. But for now, we're going to stick with chapter and verse, just the, the facts that we can all read right now. But if you said, Darren, take a step back for a second and give us a hot take, your personal lay of the land on what was going on there. Well, I would tell you that Peter, around whom Cox could still be heard crowing from his denial of Christ, and James were both neck deep in Jews. All the other Christians were on the run and being stoned to death, but not these two. Living without a care, smack dab in the middle of enemy territory in Jerusalem. And if they didn't cut a deal with the Pharisees, I'd love to hear an alternate explanation. Personally, I think Peter had a pretty finely tuned instinct for survival and was just making the best of a bad situation. But James, on the other hand, is where I think the real subversion was happening. James was being lionized as the leader of a messianic cult called the Ebionites. Now, these are the original Judaizers who denied the divinity of Jesus, and they clung to all of the 613 of the nutjob Torah laws. In fact, they claimed James was the real bishop of the church, not Peter. And we also find out their Ebionite Bible was the massively Judaized Gospel of Matthew. Want me to keep going? Okay, well, I think Paul told Peter and James about his revelation and showed him what he had written down over that 15-day visit. And James and his Ebionite fanboys created the Mithean Gospel after seeing it, a perverted and Judaized version of the Gospel of the Lord. Now, maybe you think I'm being dramatic. Think maybe I'm making a big deal out of nothing. Well, let's crack open that Bible and look at Galatians again, chapter 1, 4 through 6. Let's read it together. I marvel that ye are so quickly changed from him that called you in the grace unto a different gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel should announce to you a gospel contrary to what ye have received, let him be accursed. Unquote. See that? A different gospel. A perverted, false gospel. Word got back to Paul about this Methian abomination. He even wrote an epistle warning the Galatians that it was a fraud. It's right there in black and white in the pre-Nicene Bible and in your modern Bible. And who exactly scribbled out this perverted gospel? Well, we know he's not talking about Mark or Luke. We already know what happened with those two. And John wouldn't come around until much later. So, no. It's definitely Matthew. Take a look at it. It reads like a guest list at a bar mitzvah. It quotes directly from the Torah 60 times. It introduces Jesus as the King of Israel, constantly referring to him as the Son of David, falsely claims Jesus fulfilled Torah prophecies using impossible linguistic gymnastics, and is, at its core, an operating manual for a messianic cult. The Judaizing Ebionite cult, written by self-worshipping Jews for Jews and to the exclusion of all others. It is the perverted gospel that Paul warns us about in Galatians. And when Paul called it perverted, I think he was being kind of charitable. In fact, we may need to do a separate episode just on Matthew. And these same Judaizers are with us today in the form of the TV preachers prancing around on stage in Hebrew prayer shawls and churches pushing the bioweapons masquerading as COVID vaccines. These are a line of some very sick, toxic, and delusional people. Anyway, that's just my personal extrapolation on that visit. Now, let's get back to chapter and verse and what we can all read for ourselves. So, Paul's 15-day visit with Peter and James in Jerusalem ends, and he goes back to Syria. For the next 14 years, nothing happens in Jerusalem in terms of the growth of Christianity. Where are all these new churches and Jewish conversos? Well, they're nowhere to be found. The only thing that has grown has been the mutant messianic cult of the Ebionites and their Matthew scrolls. Now, by this time, James has become a cult icon among the Judaizers, and his power has grown immensely. And the Pharisees, no doubt twirling magic chickens over their heads, are more than happy to watch the subversion 
bring Christianity to a close. And it is precisely at this tipping point that God sends Paul a new revelation. He is to go back to Jerusalem, now 14 years later, and get the ship of Christianity back on course. As we read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, Then, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the nations. Unquote. Now, here's where things get interesting. And I mean very, very interesting. And again, I don't want anyone to get lost in the weeds at this critical juncture. Now, which gospel is Paul talking about? Which gospel does he communicate unto them? That's right, the gospel of the Lord, the revelation he received directly from Jesus Christ. And if the light bulb hasn't turned on yet, I'm not sure what to tell you. Now, this gospel of the Lord, to whom does he say he preaches it to? The nations. And who are the nations? The nations of Jews? No. In fact, when nations is used, it refers to all the people of the world except Jews. So what just happened here? Paul has just told Peter, James, John, and the phalanx of Jews and the Ebionite cult that they're hanging out with what the gospel of the Lord is, telling them all the revelation he received and that he's preaching it to other people in the known world. And by the way, he's preaching it in Greek. In fact, all of his epistles were written in Greek. And one of Paul's assistants that he brings to the meeting is a Greek named Titus. And the first thing that Peter's group wants to do is chop off Titus's foreskin right there on the spot. I'll let him tell you about it. The very next verse, verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And the next verse, Paul lays it all out for us. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Unquote. Yep, you guessed it. The Judaizers, the Ebionites, and their perverted false gospel. The false brethren. No different now than when they were slinking in the grass 2,000 years ago at that meeting. And now we come to the apex of today's episode in the next verse. This is where the deal is made. This is where you need to decide which fork in the road you're going to take as a Christian. Paul says, Having seen that I was entrusted the gospel of the uncircumcision, and having perceived the grace that was given me, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. Now, first of all, Cephas is Peter, so don't get hung up on that. As you listen to it, remember that nations and uncircumcision refers to everyone except Jews, the larger world, you and I. And in that last part, we learn that Peter and James are to preach strictly to Jews. Paul preaches to us. Peter and James preached to the Jews. One more time. Having seen that I was entrusted the gospel of the uncircumcision, and having perceived the grace that was given me, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. Now let that sink in real slow. Let it sink in real good. Paul is to preach his revelation, the gospel of the Lord to us, the nations, the uncircumcised. Peter and James are to preach their gospel, and you can decide what it is because I have no idea. Maybe it was Matthew's gospel. Whatever it was, they were tasked with using it to convert Jews. In other words, preach it to the circumcised. Now let's just cut to the chase on this. We're talking about two completely different target audiences. We're talking about two completely different Gospels. If you ask me, I say it's two completely different religions. But don't take my word for any of this. Pop open that huge King James Bible and read it for yourself. You don't have to dance on the head of a pin or squeeze through the eye of a needle to make sense of it. It's clear as day, black and white. And for millions of the pre-Nicene Christians, it was an easy choice to make. 
And after that gospel of the Lord and the original ten books were compiled for the first time, the Christians finally had their own Bible in 144 AD. So it comes down to a simple question when you ask which gospel you should be reading. Well, are you a Christian or a Jew? Now, before I wrap it up, you might be thinking, whoa, Darren, with two completely different gospels, how did they get along? How could two totally different theological foundations and conflicting doctrine and dogma harmonize and coexist? Well, the simple answer is they didn't. In fact, just as you guessed, they couldn't. And it didn't take long for Paul and Peter and the rest of the Judaizers to almost come to blows. And it set the stage for a showdown at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. And I'll have a link in the show notes for the episode that FBN did on that. I hope you enjoyed today's deep dive into gospel history. And if you want a free copy of Paul's Gospel of the Lord and that original Christian Bible from 144 AD, just go to theveryfirstbible.org.org. Let's end it with that verse from Galatians chapter 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ.